Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm I'm trying to be careful in in what I say, but a lot of what I'm seeing is, and I think of a lot of what we do as real estate agents is we always point the fingers to buyers and sellers. And, and so we make a presentation to a buyer and they don't want to go with us or they don't want to sign the buyer broker agreement. And it's, oh God, these buyers are terrible people. I don't know what's wrong with them. And, and I see these posts on Facebook. I've just presented you know three buyer broker agreements this weekend and all three of them decided they want to go directly to the seller. What's wrong with buyers and da 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 da. And so it's not always something wrong with the buyers. And I, I wish that my conversion rate was at 100%. And it's not. And, and it is what it is. The best of us don't convert at 100%. Yep. And if I don't land the deal, and for, for, for today's topic, specifically talking about getting somebody to sign a buyer broker exclusive agreement, I kind of spend more time asking myself what went wrong during my presentation rather than just kind of point the finger at the buyer and say what's wrong with them. So these are three questions to ask yourself. Number one is, is did I present my value well enough? I mean, did, did they have a clear understanding when I got done with this presentation uh, uh, that they understand the value that I bring to the table? I feel like if somebody is not willing to sign a buyer broker agreement, with me, I feel like somewhere along the ways, I dropped the ball. I didn't clearly articulate the value that I bring to the table because I feel like if you understood the value that I bring to the table, you wouldn't have a problem signing it. So if you don't sign it, what went wrong in my presentation? So how was my presentation? And and then I go, then I, last question I ask myself is, what I've hired me? <laughs> you know, sometimes I walk away going, boy, I didn't. I didn't hit it out of the ballpark there. Yeah, you know, the, <clears throat> self reflection is always a good thing. And in this particular perspective, westusadisc.com. Go to westusa westusadisc.com, and that's D-I-S-C. There's a self assessment uh, ex- test you can take. It's 27 questions. It's real easy. But let's face it. You know, we all have strengths. We all have weaknesses, uh, and we need to be able to identify who our audience is. You know, and then we have to be able to be a chameleon. We have to be able to manipulate our presentation to speak to the mind to the assessment of whoever it is we may be speaking to. And that may sound like, oh my God, it's a real complicated issue, but it's really not. It's real simple. Um, And then of course it's less, it says, how is my presentation on here? Um, You know, in retrospect, now presentation is not necessarily a video slide, a, you know, a a set of marketing slides, uh, you know, a PowerPoint or any of these things. It's the overall what did I convey and how did the consumer perceive what I conveyed? And I think that's really the disconnect is we tell them what we want to tell them. We don't tell them what they need to hear to hire us. And and that's a really fine line. Um, so, yeah, I, I always believe in self-reflection. All right. Number two question I ask myself is obviously did I explain the nuances of the buyer broker agreement properly? Did they walk away from this pre- presentation understanding what the buyer broker agreement states, uh, who's responsible for what, what happens in certain situations. And I think where a lot of the disconnect is, um, because I do see it on on Facebook, um, is agents are pretty much explaining to other agents, and those agents are explaining to their buyers that you have to pay me. And it is not a foregone conclusion. I try to explain to my buyers, no, you don't, it, it, not in every situation are you going to have to pay me because we're still going to try to negotiate with the seller. I feel like if you walk away from that presentation and that buyer doesn't understand all the options and all the different scenarios and they just think regardless of what happens, regardless of the home, regardless of the seller, I'm going to have to cough up you know, X amount of dollars or whatever the case is, I think then that's a, that's a problem. And then I, then through that, have I explained my negotiating skills because we're still going to focus on in, in these situations and every offer that we make, we are going to ask the seller to pay for my services. And this is how we're going to do it. And this is the process. And these are the forms in which we are going to use 
in order to get the seller to pay for as much of it as possible. And then, of course, uh, you know, do they understand the risks of not using an agent? If you walk away from this presentation uh, and you say, well, oh, my gosh, well, I'm going to have to pay a buyer's agent, then you, you failed there. Right. Uh, but do they walk away going, hey, I'm just going to do this myself? And have you clearly articulated the risks associated with buying a home unrepresented? And I think this also goes to what we've been talking about over the last four months, actually, at, relating to the buyer-broker agreement is, are we actually – allowing the consumer to tell us what their obstacles to that document are versus are we introducing obstacles that are causing us to not be able to get the buyer broker? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, you know, maybe I better get more information before I sign this document with anybody, you know, versus, you know, what are the, you know, what have you heard about it? You know, what are the issues that you see? Um, you know, yes, you're, you know, this document has been, it, it has been burdened upon you and also upon us. Um, we didn't, you know, this isn't something that my brokerage or myself, uh, you know, you know, is creating. But put the consumer in a position where they're telling you what their obstacles are to that document so that you're not creating your own. And I think that's the, a big issue here. You, you remember a couple of weeks ago we had Tom Wolf on? Yes. And I don't know if you remember what he said. And I took it and I made a meme of it. I mean, this is just part of what I'm training my team on is that you can't explain the buyer broker agreement as a document in which the buyer is going to have to pay you what's on that buyer broker agreement as opposed to it's what your buyer th is authorizing you to get paid. Yep, exactly. And the mindset and how you explain that is is totally different. Totally different. All right, third thing is, did I present in the right setting? Where was I when I made this presentation? Where was I when I did this buyer consult? And I feel like, especially when we're talking with new leads, it is incredibly difficult to present value, incredibly difficult to take them down this path on the phone. I realize there are some situations um, that are unavoidable, and even if they're out of state or I can't meet with them in person, I will always choose Zoom over a phone call, but you have to, you have to take into consideration you know, what is that setting? If it's someone who's calling on my sign or a sign or whatever the case is, uh, I'm, I, I would rather just set the appointment to go show them the home and show up with a buyer broker agreement or a showing agreement rather than having to explain to them on the phone and say, hey, before I meet you, I'm going to email you this document. It's, it's a big, tall ask. So I try... In, in, in as many settings or as many cases as I can, I always try to do my buyer consultations where I'm going to explain these documents in person. Uh, I try to do it at all costs. And if I can't, Zoom. But if I walk away and I don't get them to sign that buyer broker agreement, that's one of the questions I have to ask. Was it the right setting? Is, is it Was it in my office? Was it in their living room? Was it at a Starbucks? And what settings are more conducive? Obviously, I would rather have them come into my office than, than meet them at a Starbucks. There's going to be a lot of uh, legal perspective that comes from this over the next six months. And what I mean by that is, you know, what is our, you know, at what point do we have to f specifically, um, you know, make sure this document is uh, discussed and signed prior to our next? Now, the way the ruling is, is it's prior to showing them homes. Um, I've heard brokers talk about the fact that you can't do any services for them, any, you know, uh, solicitations. If they call you on the phone and they're trying to basically solicit your services, um, what can, how far can you go? Uh, and, and what does it mean? Uh, I, you know, this is sales 101. The job is to get the people in front of you. And so if, in fact, that might be Zoom today, but again, it's uh, having a environment that is not a fast-paced environment. It's an environment where everybody is comfortable. Uh, they're willing to take the time necessary to ask and answer questions. Um, and so when somebody's on the phone, they're talking about a home that you have listed or one that showed up on your website. Oh, isn't that a great home, Mr. and Mrs. Smith? When would you like to see it? Uh, well, how about 
Saturday at three. Great. That would be awesome. Uh, when would you like to meet me at my office? I mean, yeah. you know, the point is just go for the appointment. And, and if you have to have conversations about the property, have conversations about the property. Uh, the secret here is it's not a you can't talk to them about anything before you represent them document. It's you can't talk. You can't show them anything without yeah. having that document. So please bifurcate those two issues. Yeah. And I'm just telling you what right now when it's still 113 degrees and you get them in front of the house and they're sweating, and everybody's Wrong hot. Place. You're gonna have an easier time getting to sign something. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That's a, that's, a on. that's a complete joke. All right, <laughs> yeah. our buyer broker yeah. agreement. Fun fact. All right, so uh, the buyer's address on line 109 of the buyer broker agreement is not required when submitting it to the broker for review. However, as I've learned from our broker team, uh, your buyer's phone number and email, if applicable, because we've learned that sometimes we have 85-year-old buyers and they just don't have don't have emails, yeah. is required on line 110. So that's your buyer broker agreement fun fact.